In Ghana, poverty levels have witnessed a considerable decline in the past two decades. Rural poverty is now almost four times as high as urban poverty compared to the 1990s when it was only twice as high. The number of people living in extreme poverty has unacceptably increased from 2.2 million to 2.4 million between 2013 and 2017. Rural poverty is now almost four times, uh, and that I have mentioned to you. But what is also interesting is this. The richest men in Ghana earn more in a month than one of the poorest women could earn in 8,000 years. And the wealthiest 10% of Ghanaians now account for 32% of the country's total consumption. This was revealed by Send Ghana as the world marked International Day for the Eradication of Poverty over the weekend. Let's build on that and let's speak to the Deputy Country Director, Dr. Emmanuel Eifa, who joins me in the studio for a conversation. A very good morning to you uh, and thank you for being here. Good morning, my Marvin, and thank you for having me. Great. And I want to say good morning to all your cherished viewers. So. Great. So paint the picture for us in terms of the Ghana story. Um, we know that COVID-19 has not done us a lot of good as well. Yeah. Where are we exactly with poverty eradication? Okay. Thank you once again. And as a statement, uh, the statement that we put out there last Saturday, which happens to be the International Day for Eradication of Poverty. We thought that once we are celebrating such or commemorating such a day, it's important as a country to step back to look at, I mean, how far we've come in terms of the job of eradicating poverty. Mm. And so we look at over the years from the 1990s, how government has actually tried to reduce poverty. And indeed, like the statement indicated, over two decades or so, we've been able to halve poverty. I mean, from a proportion of 56% of the population being poor in the 1992, up to currently 2017 figures using the Ghana Living Standard uh, Survey from Sasca Service, we have what's called a poverty profile, which shows that just now um, 2.4 million of our population are poor. That, that goes to tell us that, yes, to some extent, the country has done well. But that is what we call, that's the monometric uh, estimate of poverty, principally using income and expenditure approach. But you and I know that poverty is multidimensional. Mm -hmm. It's not just about income or expenditure. Poverty concerns health, it concerns education, it concerns a whole lot of housing, housing a whole lot of deprivations. And so the Ghana Statistical Service came up with what is called the multidimensional poverty index. And it is something that has been championed over the years by the UN. And it's not only Ghana, it's been done in quite some number of countries. And so this is the first time that recently, that was uh, this year actually, that it shows that multidimensionally, instead of us being uh, poor in terms of when we are looking at just the monometric, which is just a small proportion when it comes to multidimensional poverty, it's around 46% of Ghanaians are poor, compared to the monometric measure, which is looking at around 23% mm. of our population. Mm. And so that tells us that, I mean, poverty though, in terms of one, we are looking at GDP growth and whatnot, we are doing well. And when it comes to the monometric measure, poverty seems to be reducing. But we look at the various deprivations, that is where the multidimensional one comes in. That tells us that we are not doing that good. Mm. Because if you have 46%, it means that roughly two in every one Ghanaian is poor, compared to one in every four Ghanaian when we are looking at the monometric measure. And this is also very relevant in this current context of COVID, like you rightly uh, alluded to. The fact is that already if more people are multidimensionally poor, COVID has really affected most people's uh, work. We have a lot of people who have been laid off. Some have not been laid off anyway, but their work has also reduced. And for that matter, it means that people are going to even be deeply in, in poverty. And so then something needs to be done about it. 
Um, these are just the statistics that I've given. But that doesn't mean that government hasn't done well. As, yeah. as I we, said. we will come to that. Yeah. Can we get into the poverty endemic areas as okay. we have it today? Okay. And so if you look at over time and even currently, what the, the multidimensional poverty shows and what the, the, the living standard monometric measure shows, clearly it is up north. Most, and that has been our story over the years. Aside that, we have rural urban dimensions and more rural women, particularly, but generally in rural areas, we have highly endemic poverty in there. And if you break it down, um, let me say that the, the multidimensional looks at just the standard of living and that principally that the monumetric measure plus the health, education and other deprivations. So if you break this thing down, aside just looking at uh, just uh, the monumetric measure, aside looking at the rural urban dichotomy in terms of uh, poverty and looking at the north-south, even in the south, central region happens to be one of, of the, the poorest uh, regions. So we come to the three northern regions. Before these statistics, we didn't have uh, the new regions. Mm. And so we don't have poverty statistics for the new regions. But I'm very sure that because those regions were carved out of the already existing northern uh, regions, the three northern regions, obviously, if we are to even do a current uh, survey today, I'm very sure that still the new regions in the north will still have not very far figures from mm -hmm. uh, the current one. Mm -hmm. Central region, as I indicated, is, but you see, it's not just even about just these two regions. Sometimes we tend to, we are tend to believe that poverty is just a rural phenomenon. I mean, look at Accra, we have what is called urban poverty. And urban poverty, per, um, the, I don't have the exact figures here, but per the multidimensional um, analysis that size car service uh, did, it clearly also shows that if we even break it, we still have huge proportion of urban uh, poverty, especially in Accra, and now that thing is also being seen in Kumasi and other, um, mm. other areas. So it's not just about it being in the north and being rural. Urban poverty is also something that is coming up. Um, let me say that, like I indicated, not that government hasn't done well at all. Yes. The I, I wanted us to structure okay. uh, the conversation. So we'll, we'll come to the interventions okay. and whether or not okay. they've done what okay. you know, they were expected yeah. to, to do, if you like. But I want also to, for us to look at the, the relationship between growth poverty mm. and reduction and inequality. Okay. Let's okay. do, let's okay. have a fair appreciation okay. of okay. this. Thank you. That. In fact, what we see that where, whereas inequality has been deepening, I mean, we have highly unequal society. If you are looking at the figures, inequality figures, compared to uh, what we see in terms of poverty reduction, especially using the monumetric measure, over the years, whereas we've been able to halve poverty, still so inequality is deepening. So that has been the paradox. Ideally, if you have poverty reducing, then you, should, you shouldn't have much more people being deeply in terms of inequality. And so that has been the discussion going forward that, I mean, for us as civil society, send Ghana and then all our other actors, we've been championing home the fact that, yes, government need to look at the widening uh, gap, meaning that more people are getting richer, sorry, very few people are getting richer and more people are getting poor. If you cite the Oxfam report that uh, you just spoke about, I mean, clearly we see that, I mean, if we have as much as uh, just 10% of, of men any huge more than what a woman will earn in 1,000 years in Ghana, then that is something that we need to look but at. What, what and it is not only even in Ghana. Mm -hmm. this, this has been some of a West African phenomenon. Yeah. Our, our big brothers... Sub-Saharan Yes, issue. yes. Our big brothers in Nigeria, who happens to be the biggest economy in West Africa, they are even worse. And so there's something called commencement to reducing inequality index, which uh, Ghana, Nigeria, and other countries uh, were part of in terms of their estimation. And it clearly shows that, yes, we are growing in terms of back, uh, talking about the gross domestic product, those, those figures that economics will turn out that they have to show as we are growing. 
Ghana happened to be the fastest growing hmm. in uh, last year, and we're touted even this year as well. But then when we look at the inequality figures, then it, it doesn't speak well of us. So that, that has been the, the issue here. So reducing poverty does not equal equality. Yeah. Yes, to, to some extent, to some extent, of course, if you're able to reduce poverty, and in terms of the dispersion, it's, it's even, then you are gradually um, tilting towards being a very equal society. But in situations where it doesn't happen like that, where, of course, you come up with all sorts of possibility reducing measures, and it doesn't really go to those who matter, then you'll be reducing poverty, like I indicated. If you are using, uh, using income as an approach, clearly it will show that, yes, you are reducing poverty. But when there are a lot of deprivations in health, in education, in other sectors, then inequality will keep um, widening. So that, that has been, but ideally, they should go, I mean, in parallel. Okay. But, but that is not the story that we see. And that has been the, the difficulty that we find ourselves in. And that's why come as a civil society, we always have been championing home the need for government to come up with certain policies mm. to try to reduce the deepening inequality that uh, we find ourselves in. So with that said, let's talk about the interventions now. Okay. And Sen Ghana has also been talking about uh, expansion of the LEAP program yeah, yeah. in recent days. Yeah. So let's look at what we have on the ground, okay. what it is supposed to address, okay. and whether or not it is meeting that objective. Okay, thank you. Um, let me say that government, in wanting to uh, reduce poverty, has come up with certain key interventions. And everything is anchored on a social protection policy as, as a country. And per that government vision was to look at about five key programs to help reduce poverty. Um, one has to do with the leap that you talked about, the livelihood empowerment against poverty, which is a conditional cash or cash transfer program that is given to the, 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 the ultra poor, those who have been identified as very poor. And that is the 2.4 million population that we, we, we talk about uh, per um, the Ghana Statistical Service 2017 figures. So that is it. Aside that, the LIP, the LIP, we have other um, things that we need to talk about in the LIP, but maybe I'll, I'll um, stop there and then I'll come back later to it. Aside the LIP, we have the capitation grant that is targeting education, giving some grants to certain educational institutions, especially the basic institutions, to help stem uh, some of the tide, the issues that they have. Aside that, we have the school feeding program, which is also to support education. Then we have um, what is called the National Health Insurance Scheme, which is something that all of us know. And the last of it, which is not well known, is something that goes to help, especially people who are working in, in the rural, rural setting. And that is, uh, is called um, livelihood, um, it's actually called a, a lip. LIP is to lift people actually out of certain um, It's different issues. from the normal it's, LIP. It's, the, it's, it's different the from the LIP. This, this, is the li that one is called, this is called Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty is the LIP. Mm -hmm. Is the LIP. And this is not, um, let, me, let me just quickly just check and then. Okay, but you can just over. explain what is supposed to be the objective yeah. of that. Okay, so the objective of that is that, um, you know, mostly in the rural areas especially, is to try to give jobs to people. And by giving jobs to people, they are um, required to do certain uh, construction. That's one of, the, one of the things. Building trenches and doing certain minimal jobs. But what happens is that one that is being done, then government need to pay them. What we know is that they are paid seven CDs per day for, for that. It is not, not that very known. It's not well known because um, mostly we don't seem to highlight that one. It's mostly the leap the NHIS, the school feeding, the capitation grant, and that is, that is what uh, is known. So these are the five uh, key social protection uh, programs that government over the years have been implementing. Okay. So what we see is that largely there are issues. Um, I'm comparing this in the context of um, Africa. Mm. So it's not just about just churning out social protection programs. Whatever you churn out, you have allocations, I mean, budgetary allocations for 
on average, what we see as researchers that in Africa, whereas um, every government on average spend 2.1 percent of GDP on social protection programs in Africa, Ghana has 0.6 percent allocation to social protection programs. So that means that we are doing very low compared to our peers, compared to the African average. And that even tells you how committed or otherwise government is in terms but of... But even in that, with that, is it mm. just on paper as in we've allocated or we're actually disbursing funds? Okay, I was coming to that. So this, that is the allocation. If you look at disbursement, that is also even low. Um, for disbursement, our analysis over the years has said, when we do budget analysis, we've been looking at specific programs or interventions. Uh, let me take them one after the other. So in terms of um, the LIP, there have been a lot of talks about the fact that uh, the LIP beneficiaries, most of the times, want either their funds to delay. And they delay because uh, government do not really actually disperse as much as they need to disperse. This has been over time. Aside the delay, mostly there are even issues that they are even not enough. It's also not enough because of issues of uh, not disbursing um, very well. If you look at the health insurance, a health insurance generates so much revenue. If you look at even 2018, 2019, a budget analysis showed that uh, whereas the revenue that generated by the health insurance through the scheme, one is about the normal payment that all of us pay the premium, about um, looking at the deduction from SNES and whatnot, just 70% actually goes to uh, the health insurance for payment and whatnot. And so if you are generating so much in terms of money for health insurance and just 70% of that total revenue is actually being dispersed to the health insurance authority, I mean, no wonder we have some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. Another even challenge you did there is that mm -hmm. certain key ailments, certain key people that are actually supposed to benefit not, I mean, there are a lot of exemptions. Mm -hmm. Women, most, most of the time, some of the, the ailments that women suffer, breast cancers and whatnot, which is becoming common to us, right? And unfortunately, the poor are those who suffer from some of these things. But these are not exempted. I Absolutely. think I heard somewhere last two weeks or so that it's something that they are try, trying to uh, bring on board. But the fact is that we are not there yet, so we could still be advocating yeah. for, for And a lot of things that you hear around this time, obviously because of the uh, elections, you have to be cautious yeah. uh, when you're hearing those yeah. promises. Yeah. But we will come back and continue with mm. this conversation mm. as uh, Mr. Anthony Kakra, Head of Industrial Statistics and Lead mm. Member of the Poverty Statistics Team of the Ghana Statistical Service joins us. But we also uh, have had results of a story that we brought to you. We're bringing it back just to draw home the need for eradication uh, or eradicating poverty. Watch this. Tambonan, a community in the northeast region, is Jaya Kwanjit, an old lady who does not know her age. But she firmly maintains that she's way younger than she looks currently. She blames poverty for draining all youthful juices in her, leaving her blind and old. She lost her sight after giving birth to her second child. Yaya lost her husband and recounts everything took a downward turn. She tries to define what poverty means to her. Poverty is when you depend on people for everything. Poverty is when you want to eat bamboo and fish, Kose, drink malt, and any other drink, but you don't have the means. That is what I consider poverty. Okay. In fact, her two sons travel to southern Ghana in search of supposed better living conditions, but only one visits her occasionally. Many times she is left to battle life alone. She cleans and does many domestic chores all by herself. 
the children in the community support by fetching water for her. She groups for her stick, getting ready to prepare breakfast. She plants her own okra and periodically gets maize from her son and sometimes people in the community. But there are days that Yaya Kwanjit goes without any food. There are days I have nothing. Sometimes the people in this community are saying I'm okay. Those are the days I have nothing but depend on water. God always sees me through. Although she has not seen her second son for several years, she holds no grudges. Rather, she blames his long absence on poverty. My son was very young when he left. This community is very poor. He had no choice but to leave. I learned he has a family down south, but he has never contacted me. I don't blame him. I know life is hard down south. Well, we, know, we all know how this story ended, really, as we shared with you. A lot of you uh, came to support her, and thank God she's not in the condition that she used to be in. Her only dream was to sleep on the mattress before she dies. Thank God she's still alive. She, she got more than one uh, of what she wanted and many other things that will make her life comfortable. Uh, back in studio right now, Ms. Antonia Kakra, Head of Industrial Statistics and a lead member of the Poverty Statistics Team of the Ghana Statistical Service joins the conversation. Good morning to you. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Uh, so from the Ghana statistical point of view, can you share the poverty trends with us as you have it? What's the latest? Yeah, um, what we have observed is that poverty over the past uh, has been declining. Um, the, but in the last uh, consumption poverty estimate that we estimated, currently we have two estimates. Mm -hmm. One on the for consumption poverty, and another for multi-dimensional poverty. When you say consumption poverty, what does it mean? Okay, basically we are looking at measuring poverty from a expenditure point of view, looking at how much how much wealth people have to spend on their self on themselves, and we observe that by 2017, the about 23.4 percent of Ghanaian uh, persons live in Ghana, Apple, and also about 8.2 percent of. Uh, People, persons living in Ghana are extremely poor. I'm sure my colleague have mentioned some of the statistics already. Uh, however, the multi-dimensional part, mm -hmm. looked, which looks at uh, poverty from different dimensions, apart from consumption, part looks says that about 45 percent of uh, persons living in Ghana are poor. Now, these statistics, especially looking at the the consumption part, since the consumption poverty is what we've been measuring over the years, we started the multi-dimensional quite recent. So we, we observe a trend, a declining trend. However, in the last one that we did, which is 2017, we observed that the, the decline was quite marginal, mm -hmm. about 0.8%. Even with the multi-dimensional you talk about? Yeah, the, yeah, the multi-dimensional, we observe, that one was a two-time. So uh, the pattern cannot clearly, we can't talk about a, a very oh, severe okay. pattern. But in terms of the consumption, probably because we've been doing over the years, mm -hmm. we can really talk about a trend. Yes, and that we've been observing a decline. Um, however, the decline, the last one we observed, uh, was quite marginal, about 0.8%. Uh, um, even though there was a decline in the rate, we observed that the number of people that were poor increased. The reason is simple, that we realized that population growth was, population was growing faster than the rate of poverty decline. Mm. And that's how come overall, the number of people that were poor increased, though the rate decline. So that's what you've been observing over the years. Okay. Actually. Okay. Is there something that you wanted to, to add to his observation? We were also talking about the link between poverty reduction and inequality. Good. And I wonder Good. if 
some of yes, your studies yes, specifically yes. address that. That, that. that is a, a key aspect of the, uh, the that, in fact, if you, if, you, if, you, uh, if you observe one of our presentation the last time, we said that inequality is a bane to poverty right. reduction. In, in general theory, you can, you can look at what contributes to poverty in two forms, in terms of growth and inequality. Whilst growth, that's uh, the GDP and all that we're talking about, has been contributing to poverty decline. The inequality, that's the extent to which wealth is distributed among Ghanaians, has been worsening, and that has caused poverty to be, not to decline as we would expect it. Mm. So, but for the inequality that has been worsening, poverty would have been declining further. Mm. So you would observe that inequality is what has been causing, has, has, has left the poverty levels at this high rate. Okay. So how, so how do we how do we fix that? Yeah. How do we fix that? And okay. have we started fixing it? You and I we've talked okay. about the kind of interventions that exist. Maybe we should launch into whether or not they've addressed the issues mm. identified. Mm. Okay. So um, before I address that, uh, let me also highlight that if you look at the multidimensional poverty and then the what I call the monometric one. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what we see is that at least in terms of the base, they were all the recent ones almost are the same year. If, if I do remember, it's 2017, yeah, yeah. 2017. And so that tells us that we are not comparing Apple. a different year to another year. So we are actually comparing the same years. Mm. And so that should tell us how serious the issue in terms of multidimensional um, poverty. J but just before we get into uh, you're going to address the question yeah. that I put up. I just wanted to ask, um, will COVID change the figures that we have? I would say we have to measure. In the statistical service, <laughs> we are always careful trying to predict, but it's likely to change it because we all know that a lot of people have lost their jobs over the period. And so to, to a large extent... Which you we, have data on, yes, by the way. Yes. <laughs> if we were to do a poverty analysis today, poverty is likely to be worsened mm. because of the impact of COVID. But if we were to do it later, then we only have to wait till we measure before we know whether there's a lag effect of the impact of COVID on poverty. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about whether or not the interventions or would we need to fix it, seeing that the, the, some of the strategies are not necessarily addressing the gaps identified. Okay. Thank you. I think before uh, my colleague came in, I started talking about the national health insurance mm -hmm. as one because if you look into the multidimensional poverty measure, mm. health is key, is one of the indicators. And we've seen that national health insurance is one of the means that gives universal access mm. to health. And so if we have a situation where, and I'm just repeating just so that we can move on, a situation where 70% of the total, just 10% of the total revenue coming from the national health insurance is given to the health insurance authority to operate. Then that means that we have issues. So why aren't we giving all the 100% uh, revenue? Considering the challenges that we always hear about in respect of uh, people not being able to access uh, health care the way they expect to access, in respect of people going to hospitals paying with a view that they'll be given the needed medication and they are told that they don't have it. In respect of the fact that there's talk about seemingly uh, the cash and carry coming back and issues like that. In respect of the fact that certain ailments that has become part of us and especially that affect women and children and then the poor more are actually not covered under health insurance. So that is just one. I spoke about LEAP, livelihood employment against poverty. And I said that per the, the, the estimates that we have, allocations to LIP, if you are comparing to the African average, is, is, is nothing to write home about. So that should tell us that government really need to really look at the LIP in terms of allocation and the disbursement, actually. Sometimes there are delays. And we see that even in terms of the amount is not enough. One household, I mean, one individual household beneficiary member receive 64 Ghana CDs for two months. For two months, 64 Ghana CDs, and it's even not coming timely. I mean, how are people really going to survive if you really we are looking at um, reducing poverty and inequality? And so government need to really look at that, increase the amount, and also try to disperse the, the money timely. Mm. 
Um, aside that, the population is 2.4, as uh, the South Class Service uh, just spoke about, 2.4 million of our population are poor. These are the extreme poverty mm -hmm. population. But we look at the leap figures, just about uh, 1.6 1, there about are actually on the leap. And so where are the remaining, where are they going? I mean, where should they get their, their listing from? So it's also a call on government to look at actually bringing on board all the 2.4 uh, million people. Last, I think last three years was 10 years of the leap existence. And so we did something called 10 years of leap existence. I mean, how has it been? Do we need to look at risk certification? Our research also has shown that some people are on it that are not necessarily even supposed to be on it. And so targeting becomes an issue. Mm. For us to be able to target very well, Ghana Sasquatch Service, I'm sure they've been looking at what is called the Ghana National Household Registry. Uh, Sasquatch Service in collaboration with the Ministry of Gender and Social Protection. When we had the lockdown, the leap, what, sorry, I said leap, uh, COVID-19 lockdown, we heard about issues of some people receiving government uh, subventions, other people not getting, and it was clearly an issue of targeting. And that serves as a wake up call for us as a nation that mm -hmm. it is important we fast track the Ghana National Household Registry. But that, that will give us a sense of who actually are the poor. Mm. I mean, we, we've been using the Ghana Living Standard Survey and other ones, but the household registry will give us a clear sense and will help us to really do targeting yeah. very well. So why right? don't we ask where we are with that, yeah. with that household registry? Yeah, yeah okay. Thank you. But before I, I, mm. I talk about that, I just want to add a little to the LEAP issue. Um, as you said, if you are paying a household about 64 uh, CDs for two months. That leaves about, about one CD something. Mm. Now, uh, we, the estimate we have for the stream poor, to be able to come out of the stream poor level, you need about two CDs, 70, 70 pesos to spend a day. And so that tells, you, that, tells, that tells us clearly that the amount that you're paying is woefully inadequate. How many people by percentage are in that category of extremely poor? Oh, about 8.2%. Uh, 8 That's okay. about 2.4 million Ghanaians are extremely poor. And so if you're able to spend about 2 to 70 pesos, if you're able to, be able to meet, uh, help them so that they can spend 2 to 70 pesos a day, they will be out of that extreme poor level. And we are paying about one city. But so even clearly, that, not all of them are covered. Oh yes, yeah. yes, yeah. about half of them. Mm -hmm. So the issue about the household registry, yes, um, we've started work with the Minister of Work and uh, Social Protection, and we hope to come to, to some conclusion. Uh, we are still in the early days yet. We hope to. The ministry have started some work, and we need to collaborate to them to be to do more. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, talk, maybe okay. what I could add to that quickly is that, you know, sometimes government starts something and then stops. Mm -hmm. They start, and that is a clear happening in terms of the household registry. It was started some time past. Um, government just did Upper West and then I think one of the Northern regions as yeah. sort of a test case. And then because always we source funding from elsewhere, once that funding mm. was in there, government decided to put a stop to it. And so when the COVID hit us, and then we thought that yes, we need this thing really. Mm. And I know that they are started, yeah. but then the thinking is that are we starting and going to stop somewhere along the line? Mm. It is important that government commit whichever way resources to make sure that, and it, it is going to in order to the benefit of all of us, and it is going to help the Ministry of Social Protection, sorry, Gender, Children and Social Protection, and Sasuka Seven and other ministries to really use these things for. So that is something mm. that we are hoping mm. that government needs to. Yeah. Yeah, and doing yeah. So we, we've started some work, as I said, mm. with uh, the ministry. Did you, and did you do some survey during the lockdown? Yes, the, uh, yes. The we did some survey on the house registry, mm -hmm. and that's what I was talking about. So we, the survey is in, in some process. We've started, as he said, we finished with three other regions. We are now going to add some other regions. And so, but it's funded by the World Bank, actually. And so if government could, I mean, if, as he said, for continuity, then we must have a sustainable plan. Mm. And of course, the donors cannot be there for us forever. Mm. So well, what did we been. use with, with what, we, uh, what we found from the lockdown? We've not analyzed the data yet. Okay. We've, not analyzed, we've, not we've not finalized the analysis yet. Hopefully, we'll finalize it. But you did 80,000, uh, you know, the survey covered some 80,000 people, out of which I think about 60% 
uh, vulnerable, homeless, poor? Yes, I mean, but as I said, that's not complete for the whole country. Mm -hmm. and so it's just a segment like the Okay, so this is this was just yes, not yes, even yes. during the lockdown. Yes. Yeah. So um to add to the issue of inequality, we we observe that um the households who who are engaged in agriculture are are, more, are the poorest. I don't know whether Doc has said that already. No, we haven't touched yeah. on mm -hmm. that, okay. which is also a very interesting yeah. revelation. Yeah. So so to be able to address the issue of inequality, you know, basically inequality you realize that a few people are participating in the growth process. So for instance, if you have oil, how many Ghanaians are participating in that in the develop in the production of the oil? That kind of thing. And so as much as possible, we should be able to implement programs mm -hmm. that to make sure that the mass of the people are participating in the growth process. But how that can way. those who feed us be the poorest? It's because of the way the, it's a structural issue. Now, for instance, if the, you know we all know that farmers have a problem with at the at the at the, at the, at the, at the selling point that mm. If so you produce chain. the chain, the value chain, of course, if you, if you produce and you cannot sell, then you have a problem. Can we, for instance, deepen the manufacturing sector where they can easily have market for their produce? The farmers can have a market for their produce. Because if you have um, problems with selling, if your marketing issues are not that good, then you cannot have quality, a good price for your product, then you have problems. And you know that farmers in developing countries like Af Ghana have that challenge a lot because and also post habit losses because the infrastructure leading to the to the farm gates are that bad and so many times we see tomato glass getting rotten and all that and so if you're able to develop the infrastructure to the farm gates and then we're able to develop factories closer to the farm gates where they can get easy they can get easy access to the market or selling to the factories then of course i'm sure that Farmers, but the poverty level for farmers will be a little down. In that do point. you make recommendations when you when you do your, your yes, service? Yes, yes, we do a, okay. do a lot of recommendations. So directly with regards to the sort of interventions that we have, I know we've talked about health with the NHIS, for instance. Uh, we've talked about the LEAP. What other areas uh, can we look at? What can we do things differently? So maybe if, if I could kind yeah, of... Yeah, but I wanted, I wanted uh -huh. specifically the point of view of the Ghana Statistical uh -huh. Service. Uh -huh. yes. If there isn't, then of course. Yes, um, I think we have to look at the structure. We have to look at the economic structure. And as I said, where is the development coming from? And how many people participate in that development, the growth process? Where is the growth coming from? How many participate in that growth? If growth is coming from a sector that a few people participate in, it, then it's only going to inure to the benefit of the general public. We know that close to 40% of the Ghanaians are into farming. How is their welfare or how is their well-being in terms of the economic activities being affected by the growth process? And so we need to look at the structure of the economy and ensure that generally the mass of the people in terms of what they do enhances their welfare. So as I said, if you're able to take care of just the farmers alone mm. to ensure that they're able to sell, get good value for their products, then close to half of the population will be fine. Okay. And so it's a structural issue. Mm. Okay. So I, right. I just wanted to add that, yes, indeed, it's a structural issue. But um, sometimes you look at it and the, the, the fact that our political setting has not also helped us. Because in most instances, you have very nice policies in place. I mean, let's look at, I'm not sounding political, but let's look at the current government interventions one district, one factory. It is going to help, if really we do it well, it's going to help some of the, solve some of the structural issues that mm -hmm. he's been talking about. If you look at in terms of uh, the modernizing agriculture program, that is where the planning for food and jobs and whatnot, if you are going to do it well, these things are all going to help uh, improve the well-being of the rural farmer. But in our monitoring, what we find, let me use even just one case of the, 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 the modernizing agriculture. A component of it is fertilizer subsidy mm -hmm. to farmers. But we are monitoring some of these things. We realize that sometimes they are even allied and political capture. And so it becomes quite difficult that it doesn't really go down to the person who matter, the, 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 the rural farmer. Smuggling and things like that are, are issues. And you go behind it and actually you even have political element who actually are sort of marshalling the bigger tracks that has to go 
to uh, distribute such um, to the farmer. Mm. So these are some of the things. It is structural, but sometimes it's also about elite and political capture. Mm. That doesn't help in some of, some of these things. Absolutely. So, so that's the point I wanted. And another thing is for me. Just to, in wrapping up. OK. For me, education is key. And so whatever policies that will come up to make sure that as much or many of our populations are actually educated, that is really going to help. And so intervention like the, the, the Ghana School Feeding Program and what at least research has shown that it increases school enrollment mm. and then of course retention. Once that is done, we are sure that at least we have a larger proportion of people going to school and the long term benefits of going to school is that people are going to get work mm. to do and, and, and all that. Okay, and then nice it's going to, families. as it were, reduce um, yeah. poverty. Yeah, um, maybe the last one, I don't know whether <laughs> we are good. wrapping up. We that, I just yes. wanted to get a last okay. thought from you. Yeah, I think uh, from all, over the years, we realized that the northern regions, the three northern regions, poverty levels have been very high in those areas. Um, I think we, we have been discussing, we really have to go into deep into addressing what what can we can do for those persons in the train or the regions? Because over the years, they, those, those are the, the regions that have had poverty, high poverty over the years. And so um, I think that if you're able to address that to some extent, then we focus target, targeting towards that area, yeah. I mean, focus that targeting towards that area, then we'll be able to address okay. some problems. All right, thank gentlemen, you. thank you so much for your thank time. You. Um, former Director General of the Ghana Maritime Authority talks about the controversies that saw him leave his posts back in 2019 also turned down an appointment as GRE board chairman in this exclusive interview with me. As Director General of the Ghana Maritime after he was accused of financial misappropriation. A year on, Kwame Owusu insists the issues surrounding the renovation of his official Bangalore then was all a creation of the media. The media was all over after Kwam Yusu, oh, uh, Papa, no, they didn't speak well. Uh, one can hear. That is the kind of unfair reporting you do to some of us. Your only complaint was that the man did that. Oh, he was arrogant. After his resignation, the president appointed him as chairman of the Ghana Revenue Authority. But why did he turn down that appointment? Did you ever step there? No. <laughs> 